Good, good evening, uh, members. Uh, we appreciate everyone being here with us. We have a gentleman that is running for office, and he's going to share some things with us. And I would appreciate if you'll pay close attention, and you'll have some time to ask questions after after his presentation. Thank you very much. His name is Jim Dore, and he's has a passion for our state and has been a foundation of his whole life career, and he's running to build a better life yet in Louisiana for his children and grandchildren. Born and raised in Louisiana, he has spent the life working on build businesses that create reliable, sustainable, good-paying jobs within our state. Jim grew up through the ranks, learning from his brother and mentor Bill. He guided several businesses units in the company and later in the Eastern Hemisphere for the largest offshore construction company in the world. Jim based his career and reputation on the idea that a culture of family and teamwork in the, is in the base, basis on which any successful company is built. He created award-winning safe working environmental strategies to keep all the employees and they all feel safe to return to their families. He believes that with that with that trust, anything is attainable. We appreciate you being with us tonight. Thank you, John. Oh, thanks. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for uh, for allowing me to, to speak uh, speak to you this evening. Uh, my name is Jim Dore, and I'm running for state representative for District 31 uh, here in Lafayette. Uh, it's currently held by Nancy Landry. Uh, that many of you, if not all of you, already know. Um, and she's termed out. We've uh, actually had a couple of meetings, um, and I've really enjoyed visiting with, uh, with Nancy and talking about some of the things that I'm very passionate about, and we actually, we're actually pretty aligned with several things. I wanna, before I really get into the program, though, I, I want to look at a few things that I had uh, actually pulled off, or looked at, and that was uh, rankings for Louisiana which was done in, I think it was February 2019, by U.S. News and World Report. And you may have already seen this, but I like looking at it because it, it continues to drive me to where I really want to go and, and why I think it's important for a change in Louisiana. But according to the 2019 Louisiana rankings, we're number 50 in opportunity in the state of Louisiana. We're number 48 in crime and corrections. 48th in physical stability, 47th in health care, 44th in infrastructure, 44th in economy, quality of life, we're ranked at 42 in education, which is extremely important to me, is 49th. Now we ought to be encouraging businesses to come to Louisiana, and in fact, it's unfortunate that we're pushing away those who've actually made it successful, certainly in oil and gas and some of the other industries. So I'll, I'll touch base, or I'll touch about, uh, on some of that here a little bit later. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a husband, uh, father, uh, now grandfather. We have three beautiful grandchildren. I'm a Louisiana native, as was mentioned just a moment ago. My father uh, was from New Iberia, Louisiana, a sharecropper, um, as his father was. Um, and then, of course, my father later went to, uh, into, served, he served in World War II, served in, in Saipan. And my mother, of course, was the daughter of an immigrant who came from Lebanon in 1898 and settled in New Iberia. I mean, two totally different cultures, if you will, trying to, that came together. But I've had a, I had a very interesting life, uh, which has been filled with uh, some ups and downs, obviously. One of those things was uh, having us move to New Orleans uh, at a very early age. Um, and of course, I, I grew up in New Orleans area. Uh, Gail, of course, in Gretna, Louisiana, my wife uh, to my right. And I uh, actually now Jeers, Louisiana, which is right across the river from, uh, from New Orleans. Both of us attended public schools. Uh, our families really couldn't afford to afford us going to, uh, to Catholic schools or private schools. Um, and as a, as a Republican and as a Catholic, um, you know, we, I, was, I was hoping to be able to go to a, to a Catholic uh, school, but we just couldn't afford that. Uh, we didn't move into our first air-conditioned home until 1968. Uh, my father, of course, used his VA loan to, uh, to buy us our first brick home, and, and that was making us again, making us move now over to Marrero, Louisiana, where I attended West Jefferson High School. Um, played track, 
uh, excuse me, ran track, played football, and uh, of course Gail was on the dance team at the time, but we, di we didn't know each other. We've never, we had never met. Uh, I, it was right after desegregation, so my school was all boys school, Gail's all girls school, so we, we always, it was challenging to even have a date or to meet anybody at the time. But it wasn't until uh, years later that Gail and I actually met. It was uh, an interesting meeting where she, she was attending a, um, a, I guess, meeting someone for, for a drink after work. Um, I had actually gone over to the same place and saw that she was speaking to an old friend of mine. We visited for a short while, and I noticed she never did ask her to dance. Uh, so finally, I, and I love to dance, so I asked her to, uh, if she wouldn't mind, I said, let's sit the dance floor. So we did, and of course, I was a big country western guy. Um, of all places, New Orleans, uh, which is urban cowboy kind of days, but um, so we went to dance, and uh, I looked over at the bar and noticed that he had left, so we, never, we just never brought, him, brought her back. We haven't seen him since, I don't think. I probably haven't talked to me, but I was really the benefactor of, uh, of uh, you know, stealing uh, Gail from somebody else, which is, you know, made me feel pretty good about that. So we, uh, we were actually, uh, we were married, married in 1982. We have two beautiful girls. Um, we now have three grandchildren. Uh, both of my girls attended UL. Um, I have a son from a previous marriage who's in, uh, in New Orleans. And he's, uh, he took the route that, that I'm gonna talk about some, hopefully this evening. He wasn't a college bound student. Um, he just, it didn't work for him. Um, he took a trade and his was woodworking. Uh, he has a passion for it, he loves it. Uh, it's something he gets up in the morning and he's raring to do. Um, so, you know, college just isn't for everybody. I, I think that we need to do a better job of trade schools and skills trainings um, and trying to find a fit for those skilled pieces, uh, skilled labor uh, areas that we, we truly need, uh, not just here in Lafayette, we need it statewide. Gil, uh, Gil attended, uh, retired from the public school system after 35 years uh, helping special need kids. Um, she began doing that, I guess, right out of high school. Uh, she was a, what we call a paraprofessional, uh, which was an extensive training in Jefferson Parish. Um, and later, which when we transferred here in 1989, she was able to continue that. And I'm proud of, of, of my wife. She, was, uh, she worked along with uh, another teacher in bringing the first sweetheart dance to the area for, uh, for some of these children. And, and it, was, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I worked with them a little bit at um, Special Olympics. I wasn't very good at coaching Special Olympics, but, but I did attend uh, and work with Gail, and, and I'm, I'm forever uh, humbled by what she had done over the course of, what, 33 or 30, almost 35 years, I guess, um, with, with challenged children. And maybe that's why she married me. I, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I'm a bit challenged myself sometimes. I, on the other hand, um, I took a different route. I uh, I did everything kind of in reverse. Uh, I worked for, uh, it, it was mentioned, I, I started ground up at a company called Global Industries. It was moved here in uh, 1973 as Global Divers. Um, we continued to, uh, to work in purchasing and acquiring companies along the way. Uh, the company, uh, we went public in 1993. We bought about 14 different companies. One name you might be familiar with is Red Adair. The Red Adair company was one we acquired um, as well. But we had a, a wonderful track record as a company that was fast, fast growing and grew, and grew quickly through acquisition, which allowed us to grow from a very, very small company to one of about uh, a little over 3,000 employees. Uh, and it great, gave me a, a wonderful opportunity to grow, to grow as a person, to grow as a manager, to grow as a leader. We started here, uh, as I said, so I started in New Orleans. We came, we lived here in Lafayette uh, from 1989 to 2005. In 2005, we were able to live in Houston, Texas. Stayed there for several years. Um, I wasn't there in Houston, but a few days, I guess. Uh, we had just moved. It was uh, right around the 4th of July, and I was told that I had a new assignment after about 24 to 48 hours, and it was to send me to uh, the Eastern Hemisphere, where my base was uh, Bangkok, Thailand. And I ran everything from, uh, from uh, well, I had projects that were running in China, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, uh, Singapore. Uh, we did a lot in the UAE, the United Arab, Arab Emirates. We've worked, I've worked in Egypt um, and of course Saudi Arabia. And the reason I mentioned that, it gave me a great opportunity to develop a strength in cultural relationships, not 
just from the standpoint of uh, geographic cultures, but company cultures, and how we have to navigate through and work through the, the, ty the different types of uh, negotiations that were necessary to, to close deals and, and to develop and create relationships uh, to grow your organization. It was a, so I've had a, a tremendous career within, uh, within a company that spanned, like as I said, 33 years or more. Um, after Global, Gail and I retired out to Destin, Florida, where we thought we, thought we were going to actually truly retire there in Destin. And it wasn't long, two and a half years or so, we got word that we had our first grandchild on the way. We were driving right down, I think it was Highway 98 in Destin, Florida, when we took the call. And it was moments after the phone was put back into the cradle that I was told what my next location would be. <laughs> and that was Lafayette, Louisiana. So we've been back here now for several years. Glad we're here, enjoying our grandkids. Um, uh, we, in fact, we watched one for the full day today. Uh, we really love being with, with, uh, with our grandchildren. Uh, it's one of the highlights of, us, of ours. I'm a lifelong learner. Um, I did a lot of things backwards. You know, I didn't really attend college um, until I went to a trade school after marrying Gail. I'm not trade school, pardon me, a community college. It was a Delgado Community College. That's why I, I, I think there's a, a there's place for people that, there is a place for people that can grow themselves and it doesn't have to be directly going to, into a university. It wasn't until I was age 46 that we were about to acquire a huge company from, uh, from France called ETPM. The company was doing well, my divisions were doing, doing extremely well, and when I asked if I'd be a part of the due diligence team, I was told that, no, why don't you go back to college and finish your degree? So at, at age 46, I went back to UL to, to, uh, to complete a degree, focused on communications, of all things, because communications is key. If we can't communicate properly and learn the, the, the right methods to communicate, uh, and to collaborate, you have to, we have to learn how to bring people together, not split us apart. And at the time, we were having an issue with millennials. So with my big brand, big idea, I said, well, if I go back to college at 46, maybe I can learn something from these students. And I was interviewed later when I, when I graduated, and I was asked, what did you really get out of college? I said, you know, I, I just have to tell you the honest to goodness truth. It wasn't not necessary academics. I learned very little from the... From the, uh, from the instructors, I learned most from the young students. They taught me how to relate to millennials and change my way of thinking. So that led me to actually write a paper on, on millennials, which even was even more important to me. So um, that's part of it, but as being a lifelong learner, I, was, I, had a, I had a wonderful opportunity to attend Harvard University uh, for a strategic marketing program. Um, later went to Rice University uh, to work with their uh, management program. So, um, you know, now of course up here of late, uh, I went to the uh, Jeff Bush held a education summit in Washington, D.C. Gail and, and Gail, uh, on her birthday actually, <laughs> came along with me. So we spent her birthday in, uh, in Washington while I was in meetings. She, uh, I think, sat around a hotel did whatever they do in this crazy little hotel we had. Later, I've, you know, I've, I've, I've attended the uh, Pelican, uh, the Pelican Summit, Pelican Institute Summit, which I have I actually brought my binder. Um, it was a full day learning experience about what's happening in government today. So I'm trying to learn as much as I possibly can. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm drinking from a fire hose, as, it, as the term goes, trying to catch up to what's happening in the world of politics in Louisiana. Well, I've witnessed a lot of it on my own. I've come to realize and learn that there is a lot behind the scene that goes on that I think needs to be addressed. So let me, that gets me to a few things that I believe are priorities in my mind for change. And I'm, I'll tell you, my disclaimer is this. You know, I'm, I'm here as much to learn as I am to talk about what I believe. What I believe may be important to me, but it may not be important to you. Uh, in order for me to represent District 31 or the people of Louisiana, it's going to be important that I understand in greater detail what you think of what's happening and what your ideas and suggestions might be. So that is sort of my disclaimer, if you will, and um, I'm not here to give answers, all the answers. Uh, as I said, I'm still learning. I'm going to do my best with this. 
Uh, and I'm sure that uh, you'll help me along as, as we go and, uh, and correct me in certain things that you might see more important to you. A lot of the information I'm going to present here in the next few minutes is, comes from uh, either the Louisiana Business and Industry Groups, which I've studied quite a bit on, and or the, um, the Pelican Institute that I've been reading a tremendous amount on. And, and I was looking for things that I believe were important to help me to um, validate some of my thoughts, if you will. The, the first one, though, is education. And, Education has been a big part of my life and, and uh, still is a priority of mine and uh, it's a very backbone of our society and I think we know that. My belief is that if we can solve, if we, if we can, it'll solve many of the problems that we have here if we have an educated workforce, an educated society. Um, I, think, I think that helps solve a lot of the issues that we have here and being 49th in the nation doesn't do us well at all and we can't be 40. 8th or 47th. We need, a, we need a leapfrog as quickly as we possibly can. Um, one, of the, one of the topics that I, would, that I thought was very important was TOPS. Now I think, thankfully, it's going to be funded. I haven't seen it yet, but it, it appears it will, it will be funded. Uh, but in my mind, there's something more as important as TOPS, and that is supporting uh, programs uh, K through 12. You know, while I'm complimentary of science, technology, engineering, and math, the STEM programs, you know, we need to prepare every child to be part, part of that, those programs moving forward. I'm particularly concerned about the schools in poverty-stricken areas. Um, or it may not be poverty-stricken, it may just be that we have uh, individuals who have either lost their jobs through oil and gas or whatever the case may be, and, and they're just uh, they're, they're kind of left being left behind in, in a lot of cases. Um, in some of the areas, and we heard our speaker last week, we talked about A and B schools, and they, was, they were very proudly touted, but when, we, you know, when it came to the DNF schools, I think we kind of, we kind of skirted, skirted the issue somewhat, and I think those are the schools I believe that we need to really truly focus on. And I, and I like the idea of a lot of the things that we're doing, is, and, and we have some great possibilities. And in Louisiana, we've been improving our, AT, our ACT scores. Um, the achievement gap continues to lessen. There are more opportunities for school choice than most other states in the nation, and traditional public schools are responding to competition with uh, several uh, and additional course offerings, such as course access, technical training in high school, through programs such as Jumpstart, Year Up, and a multitude of other programs. And in fact, it, I've been having my own discussions with many of the different program owners uh, and directors, and honestly, they don't talk to one another. So I think they're. They're running similar programs. It's costing our state a lot of money because we're funding all of it. But we should have some sort of, we need a summit to bring all of these programs together in a room, endless fashion, a, uh, a real good program, a solid program that is complimentary and works for our students. So we need to host a summit to combine all the necessary experiences that we have. We still lag at the bottom third of most of nation, national rankings and will likely continue to do so for a while as we, uh, as the standards and assessments are raised to become as rigorous as other states. Education and jobs are the past out of poverty and uh, Louisiana citizens deserve the quality of life offered to citizens in prosperous states. There's a lot of work to be done in the area of education and we must stop the budget shortfalls that take away from our future, educating our young. You know, as we know, and I'm sure all of you do, that anytime there's a shortfall in our budgets, there are really two areas that the money comes from. It's uh, drawn from education, it's drawn from health care. We have to stop that. We need to right side that ship. We need more accountability, uh, such as identify, identifying the failing schools, teacher accountability, uh, I think real and true evaluating systems for the teachers and the leadership that we have. We need training programs for teachers, mentoring programs and leadership programs for principals. Uh, and I also believe in, in drug testing like the private sector workforce. I really do believe in drug testing and my company, we did it. And if I have, if I have teachers and individuals that are in, left in the classroom with my, uh, my children and grandchildren, I see no reason why they shouldn't be drug tested uh, just like the regular workforce that's out there today. So this leads me to workforce development. Louisiana's unemployment crisis isn't due to the lack of available jobs. There are a lot, I think there are a lot of available jobs here in Louisiana. It's a result of a lack of qualified workers who possess both the technical and soft skills required in our increasingly technical economy. 
uh, it was CGI, I believe it was, when we had Gail and I attended Junior Achievement um, Awards Banquet, and I, the number of open positions that they have is astounding, and they're 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 uh, they're struggling to find qualified people here in Lafayette. So they're, they're, they have a nationwide search for uh, for people that could work at at, uh, at that particular firm. But we must have a transformation of Louisiana's workforce development system to become market driven and employer employer connected. And we have a disconnect as to what we believe we need to train for and what the uh, what the work or the employers have a need for. So we we need to work more with the industry to determine what programs are needed to be able to hire qualified people in Louisiana. We need to advocate for additional training and recruitment of skilled trades, men and women, to combat the workforce shortage in critical sectors such as construction and manufacturing. That's where I believe the trade schools could be a tremendous help. Uh, we need to support programs in high school that offer training and workforce skills development. When I was younger, I know we had small gas engines, we had electronic, we had even, I think even our high school, we even offered uh, air conditioning, um, HVAC heating and air conditioning and, and vent work. We. I don't think we're doing any of that. We, we had home economics even um, in, in our schools, and I think a lot of that's been lost. We have thousands of oil and gas workers that uh, can be repurposed if we only had a program that would include an outreach. I actually had um, one of the individuals who I work with as an executive coach who was searching for people that he needed in West Texas but they're not available. Um, so I began to utilize, so I'll tell him, and I knew of individuals in a, in a like industry, which was remotely operated vehicles and subsea equipment, that could easily be trained to do the work that he requires in those areas. And instead, we're hiring Texans. Why aren't we hiring Louisianians, even though we have to be, or we are in Texas. So we need to work on programs like that. And the other thing that I'm, I am really um, con at a loss for is why aren't we utilizing the pool of extremely talented, educated workforce, and that's called the retired community. So when I retired, I was uh, 55, and even at 55 years of age, um, I had a tough time getting a job in Houston, Texas. That I was looked at as being you know, um, archaic because everybody wanted the young, new buck. But the problem is that none of them had any experience. So uh, I think that we need to be able to have a workforce program that actually looks at this thing in a holistic approach as to what's available out there, utilize some of the experience that we have, repurpose some of the individuals that, we've, that we have in, in our workforce that I think could be uh, very, well, uh, very well used. So with an educated workforce, we could be uh, certainly more competitive and companies will want to be here to access our talent. And I think that's what one of the missing cogs that we have. Uh, we have, I think, incredibly intelligent people. We just need to train them up, if you will, or train them for, the, for what the industry is looking for. And I don't know that we're doing a real good job of that. And I think it could be certainly better. So if we educate our people, we have a great workforce, and we want to bring industry here that has the possibilities of, of exporting and importing and moving uh, equipment and services across state lines and even internationally, um, we need an infrastructure that will protect existing businesses and bring new business here to, to Lafayette and into Louisiana. Um, in fact, a good friend of mine who is another one that is one of my executive coaches was just featured uh, on at the 10 o'clock news for helping flood victims uh, at, with Amerigo these bags who've got a great manufacturing facility. But some of the costs that he's being confronted with are the, co the, the high transportation costs for getting, uh, for getting trucks and uh, getting them moving. But the other part that concerns me is this. I, I think the infrastructure is key to drawing new business. Um, but we also need safe transportation for energy agriculture. And here's the ones that kind of get left out. Agriculture, fishing, the cattle industry, and many, many other industries in Louisiana. We just talk about I-10 and I-49, and, and I think it's wonderful. We have a $14 billion backlog. Um, in infrastructure projects in Louisiana. I was stunned when I heard that from DOD or DODT. I was stunned. And here's what bothers me. Um, when we travel across the roadways, what we don't need to have is a catastrophic event for us to, to, to fund these projects. We have to work diligently to be able to have uh, access. So what bothers me is that the loss of a bridge or hurricane evacuation or any additional flooding as we've been experiencing here in Lafayette it can only lead to more de de uh, devastation in our area and certainly to Louisiana. 
We need a modernized infrastructure system across all modes of transportation. It's paramount. It's paramount in fueling Louisiana's economy. And we need to focus on common sense policies and reforms geared to increase statewide productivity and enhance businesses. Businesses' ability to move their products across the nation and remain globally relevant. The key in this one here is common sense. I think we've lost a lot of that in Baton Rouge, and what we've done is drawn a line in the sand. For some silly, ridiculous reason, we've taken part partisan po politics to a whole new level, not just in the nation, but here in Louisiana as well. But we need to support the use of objective criteria, including fostering economic development to prioritize funding for state highway construction projects. We need to propose allowing the legislation to add and substitute projects in the final construction programs. New investment in the energy sector is being lost. <coughs> and that gets me to Louisiana being what I call a Sue Happy State. Uh, government litigation, you know, really needs to come to a halt. There is a need for judicial reform in our state. Lafayette is suffering from the coastal and legacy suits being filed. And it's not totally that. Uh, a lot of it has to do, many of them, uh, with the, the drilling happening in, happening in the Permian Basin in Texas and West Texas areas. Our restaurants, our dentists, our uh, eye, ear, nose, and throat specialists, closing stores, and many others are hurting because of the loss of jobs. And small business in general is hurting in, in Lafayette. The legacy lawsuits, if you aren't familiar with them, and we can talk about them later, um, but I know of a, of a couple of examples in, in which I'll share with you. One of those is where we had three independents here in Lafayette and bought their properties $100 oil. So can you imagine what the price is now and how they're able to pay off debt? That's a challenge to them. So they had agreed to consolidate. Everything was going pretty well. They actually found some in potential investors when the investors came, uh, they did were doing due diligence and began to understand and realize what legacy lawsuits were all about. They turned and walked away. Uh, they didn't think that the risk reward profile was good enough for them. They felt that having investment in Louisiana in an area that has a potential for them to be sued was enough to, for them to walk away. That's another independent about his drilling program. Uh, so to, I know you're a Louisiana company, how are you doing with Louisiana drilling? And his quote to me was, Jim, I will never drill in Louisiana again. He said, I don't want to be part of any particular lawsuits. It just doesn't do both well for me. The severance tax here, even in Louisiana, is 12.5%, plus they're paying a 25% royalty. Go to Texas, and it's 6% 6, 6 perhaps, I think it is 6% or less in a severance tax. So Texas is welcoming oil and gas, and we're kind of booting them in the back, back of their <coughs> rears. And I don't think that's a, that's a great way to treat businesses that, uh, with the natural resources that we have, and we're not actually asking people to stay here and be here, not that we even want them here. That's the message they're getting. So the onslaught of government-sponsored lawsuits created a damaging precedent on regulatory, uh, of regulation through litigation. But it also sends a, a message to those who want to invest here in Louisiana. You know, why, uh, the, the message is, don't come here, we're going to sue you anyway. But we have to address the, uh, this immediately and bring jobs and investment back. Is it going to be an easy task? No. Is it going to be time consuming? Yes. Um, but we, you know, without new investment, we will not have new drilling. We will not have new job opportunities. We're going to continue to lose people. That's important to us. The other issue has now, actually the House is finally talking about it. Gail and I used to joke about it, but it wasn't a really funny joke. And when we were driving to, from Highway 90 to New Orleans, oh, excuse me, from Lafayette to New Orleans to see Gail's dad, uh, who by the way is, uh, is a World War II veteran himself, 93 years of age, worked the, walked at the Burma Highway. Um, the man's, uh, he's incredible, I love him. Uh, but when we drive back and forth to see Gail's father, all we see are billboards. Um, and it's billboards about you know, if you've been hurt in, by a truck, if a truck's run in a car, or if you've been in an offshore accident, um, we can make you a lot of money, and the fact of the matter is they really don't. Um, but not only that, it, it takes up space for anybody else who wants to advertise. Every sign is taken. It's just amazing. Um, 
I'm all about tort reform. I think that needs. To, I think we need to curb that. We need to somehow find a way to, to find some middle ground with it. But <clears throat> by other thing is, I think we need to lower the uh, the threshold for jury trials. I think it's fifty thousand dollars. We need to lower that far lower than what it is. I think people deserve a right to be heard. One of them that floored me the other day when I was uh, talking to Sharon Hewitt, and you may have seen it in the news. It was called a seatbelt. It was a seatbelt law that had been enacted. But uh, when the, there is a jury trial. The, there, you cannot ask a question about whether or not you were wearing a seatbelt. I, I was stunned by that. I mean, I, I mean, what, what about you know, being a, having the opportunity to tell the entire story? So, uh, an attorney for the defense cannot ask a question, and that question would be, "Were you wearing your seatbelt, sir?" Can't do it. So, hopefully, they'll get that bill passed. Uh, I think they're working on that bill uh, in Baton Rouge now. Health care, um, this is some stuff, these are some items from the Pelican Institute, um, and it's more about Medicaid enrollment, uh, which has blown past initial projections of 306,000 uninsured individuals to in 2017, an enrollment of 456,000 and growing. Uh, Medicaid enrollment has exceeded projections in most states as embrace Obamacare. Um, and then rising Medicaid cost spending over the last 30 years has crowded out other Louisiana priorities because it's taken up so much of our budget. Um, the Obamacare is encouraging uh, Louisiana to prioritize the able-bodied over the most vulnerable and most Obamacare expansion enrollees could work or prepare for work, and, uh, but they don't work full-time. One of the things that I had learned was the fact that uh, one, I, I think Medicaid's important. I, th I think Medicaid is needed for those who need it. Um, but I think some of the abuse has taken place, and a recent statistic was, I think, on a nat nationwide basis, they they'd identified over $2.1 billion, billion dollars in, uh, in Medicaid fraud. I, I think that's where the issue is for me, uh, is making sure that those people who deserve it and, and it was intended for are able to get it and not have people gaming the system. Uh, so I think that's something that needs to be addressed. I think we ought to increase some wellness incentives, increase uh, access to home-based care for or the clinically, uh, chronically ill, uh, crack down on fraudulent scam orders, which I mentioned, um, and prevent the use of taxpayer dollars to cover individuals who already have affordable health insurance. What I understood it to be, and hopefully it took corrective action, is it's, it's a voluntary, so you voluntarily offer what your income is and you may do that at the beginning of the month and of course you become qualified well you may get a job i don't know three months later well one month later but you remain on the roll till the end of the year till you go back and requalify so you're actually you could have the insurance you're getting the, the money it doesn't make sense um, I, I met with jay darden over this actually i drove to baton rouge i said i've got to understand this and i asked him about it and he claims that there there is uh, they're going to be help on the way that they're going to be adjusting the way they're tracking people who are on Medicaid, um, how they're being how they're being paid, uh, and finding finally having an ability to identify potential fraud. So that's yet to be seen. I hope it really works, uh, but we need to look hard at that. We really do. It gets me because all these costs we, we, we talked about accumulating brings me down to another item, and that's called just budget cleanup, and because we do have some budget woes. Discretionary spending comprises only about 11% of our budget, about 11%. I actually thought it was this big budget we had, and, you know, and it wasn't until I started back, what, in May, that I began to really, really focus on the budget. But 11% of our Louisiana budget um, in the fiscal year ending uh, 2018, of course. Lawmakers need to address the nearly 90% of spending blocked in silos, and, and it's not available. It just isn't available for discretionary use. State budget of $31.1 billion, federal funds 13.2, non-discretionary 6, uh, self-generated 4.3 billion, statutory dedications 4.2 billion, discretionary spending 3.4 billion. As currently constructed, the state's rainy day fund officially termed a budget stabilization fund requires lawmakers to contribute a minimum of only $25 million per year, or less than 0.1% of the overall budget to offset revenue swings. We've got to do something. While state spending has remained relatively flat over the past 10 years, that fact ignores the, the nearly 50% growth, 50% growth in state spending in the years after Hurricane Katrina. The Pew Charity uh, Charitable Trust also notes that uh, as of 2015, federal revenue comprised 42.2% .2 
for the Louisiana budget, the highest among all 50 states. <coughs> so some possible solutions could be, uh, you know, ending the arbitrary silos, improve revenue forecasting in the short and the long term, uh, and, and working uh, with, uh, with a bipartisan approach to actually develop and create a budget enact policies to bolster transfers to the rainy day fund both by increasing annual transfers to the fund and the maximum level of revenues the fund can hold. Reset the state spending cap to prevent state government in Louisiana from growing without limitation. Um, and I think we need to have some sunset provisions. I, you know, we have these things that are dedicated funds that have been in there since the 1940s and 50s. Um, that brings me to something I didn't on here, and that is the, the thought of a constitutional convention. Um, if, you're not, if you haven't asked about that, I'm sure somebody will. I believe in the constitutional convention, but I, don't, I think it needs to be a limited constitutional convention looking at, uh, at the fiscal reform and some other items in it. But I don't think we want to open this, this Pandora's box. I, I don't think we can ever settle it in our lifetimes, given, given the attitude and the relationships that we, that we have in Baton Rouge today. We've lost a lot of confidence in, uh, in our lawmakers, there's no doubt I have, for sure. Um, and it's my mission to restore some of that confidence, and that's just work, working with people here in Lafayette and the people I represent. Listening, sharing ideas and thoughts are important. Creating a relationship that includes transparency, um, where we can both talk very openly and be very transparent with our feelings about certain items and issues. And, um, that's something we haven't seen in Louisiana in a long, 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 long time. I don't have all the answers. I'm a good student. Um, I'm committed to learning and changing Lafayette and making it better for, our, for all of our kids and our grandkids. Um, you know, I want to be proud of my home. I want to be proud of, uh, of, of my state. You know, having lived in Texas, having lived in, in Florida, um, for uh, many years. I came back to Louisiana and, and even in Lafayette, I, I've seen such little change. The only change, the, the biggest change I've seen is the attitude of the state legislature. Um, I, I had an uncle who's a, who's a Democrat, by the way. His name was Bo Ackle. Uh, Bo uh, was a tremendous communicator. He, was, he had no issues with crossing the aisle and trying to develop a, a fashion, a way of uh, of coming to a resolution with an issue. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy that he was, he was my, my relative. Of course, I'm a Republican, and of course, I, you know, believe it or not, I was a Democrat my whole life. I was born in 1954. I was 18 years of age, went to my mom and dad and said, so, what am I supposed to register as? I'm not, no, I'm supposed to register. My dad said, hey, you're gonna register Democrat. But the Democrats of, of, of then seem to be the Republicans of now. It's sort of like they've changed roles. Um, in my opinion, anyway. But the fact of the matter is, I am a Republican, I'm a, and I'm a Catholic. It, it, for me, it isn't about what party I belong to. It's about doing what's right. It's about doing what I believe in my heart is the thing that, that I think, after research, study, and, and a lot of thought, is right for the people here in Lafayette and right for the people of Louisiana. And I think we're missing a lot of that. There's one thing that's important to me, and I mean, extremely important, it's something that I, that I don't want, and I hope will never compromise, but it never, which is never in my thought process, and that's tarnishing my last name. Um, the only thing I'm gonna take to my grave, the only thing any of us takes to our, our grave is our last name, and people are gonna stand over us, and they're gonna say, man, you know what? This guy, you know, he should be proud, his family should be proud for, for what he did and what he stood for. If that's not the case, why am I here? So why am I running for, for office? It started out with uh, someone asked me to run uh, for Congress. I did some research and found that Clay Higgins at this point in time was probably not beatable. The Cajun John Wayne's very likable in this area, as we found out in the election. So, But they did advise me uh, that they needed me more in Baton Rouge than they needed me in Washington, D.C. And I've always told my kids, and I'm sure you have to, that if you're gonna stand around and you're gonna complain about something, you have two options. You can just sit there and complain your life away and just be part of the problem, or you can actually get off your rear end and you can do the best you can to solve the problem, or at least participate and do the best you can in solving that problem. And that's where I stand in life today. 
What I do do for a living now is I work with, with, uh, with CEOs in the area. I, I chair a monthly meeting with a group of CEOs here. We talk about problem solving, uh, compromise, negotiate, how to get them to a whole new level. And then I'm, then I'm an, their executive coach. I have one company that actually sit inside his office and I work with nine of his executives. <coughs> So am I, do I feel prepared for this? I absolutely am prepared for this. Do I have time to do this? I have time. I have energy. I don't have a real company to run. And to be honest with you, if I'm a one and done guy and I've accomplished a little bit because you know, people just don't like the idea that I'm doing what I believe is right for our community, then so be it. I'm Jim Dore, uh, running for state representative for District 31, and I really uh, love your support. So if you have any additional questions, I'm, I'm here all night. <laughs> Thank you. If there's a question out there, we, we please ask you to come to, uh, to the front here and, and the mic so we can run that through the, our little uh, program that we try and put out to YouTube. That's highly unusual. We need to always have one or two questions. I know that lady's got a question. <clears throat> Thank you for being here. Hi. First, I want to thank you for running. Um, you are, um, it, you would be my representative if you were to win. I live in uh, that particular district. Um, I um, agree. Um, I uh, identified with most of what you said. Um, the one area that I feel like we need to open up for more conversation uh, in this area as well as throughout Louisiana is um, with regard to the oil and gas industry. First, my father was a company man. He was a geologist, worked for Shell his entire career. I was in oil and gas 25 years. I retired in 2005. Um, I think the oil and gas industry has been really good, provided a lot of jobs, but I think they've been a poor steward of the environment. There's a lot of contamination sites that have been sitting for decades, thre threatening our water resources. And some lawsuits, if that's what it takes to get them to the table rather than us paying for it with our health or paying for it with our tax dollars to clean it up is what I have a problem with. And I'd like to talk one day, or well, have I'll, you I'll, talk I'll about talk it. About that for your second. Yeah, um, for your I appreciate uh, what you said about the transferable skills. I agree. Our workforce, our oil and gas, a lot of that is transferable. We have a water economy that we could grow. Garrett Graves has talked a lot about it. Um, which brings me to um, effective state government with regard to this issue that I'm talking about. And um, there's a bill right now that's going to be heard on Thursday, House Bill 510. It basically creates a procedure whereby any facility can conduct an environmental audit and submit it to DEQ and the findings, the science, the data, no matter how close it is or what great a risk, other than imminent and substantial, okay, which is something we can argue, you know, till the cows come home, as my dad used to say. But um, so the that particular audit report, provided it's voluntary, shall never be disclosed. Okay? Never. And it threatens the water resources. And the information in the audit report is to be uh, held as privilege. Okay? Um, this serves no purpose 
other than protecting a polluting facility. It's contrary to state public record laws, and it conflicts with US EPA uh, policy. How can a bill like that possibly be good for good government, and how could it possibly be and make Louisiana better? Excellent. I mean, great questions. Um, let me address the first one, uh, which you know we talked about the, the lawsuits and the like. Um, I'm going to actually. I'm, I'm anticipating that um, that one of my opponents is going to bring this up because um, my my brother Bill Doré, of course, you know, who was our chairman and founder. Are there? A Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Oh, yeah, okay. and, and I don't mind telling you. Yes, there. Well, I shouldn't okay. tell you. No, there are no points. No, there's, there's a gentleman named Gus Rance who uh, has runs acute uh, acute healthcare hospitals, and uh, Jonathan Goudeau. Jonathan has a uh, I call it family entertainment business where they sell pool tables and entertainment sort of things. Yeah, both really good guys. I've actually called him, had breakfast, coffee with him, and I, I just felt it was important to at least put names and faces and just get comfortable. So let me let me talk about what happened with that. And it's not very much away from what you're saying. Um, I guess it was 1998 or maybe 2000 or so. My brother had purchased a, a place that he absolutely loved. Uh, my company used to be able to go and we'd hunt. It was in uh, Cameron, Louisiana, Cameron Meadows, 6,500 acres of beautiful marshland. And my brother wanted to acquire that marshland from uh, then Santa Fe Construction. Uh, it, was on, it was part of Santa Fe Drilling, which was owned by the Kuwaitis. It's a whole long story. But he loved to hunt. My brother graduated from McNeese, unfortunately, but he loved to go out and hunt and geese and fish. So uh, he had bought that for his family because that's what he wanted his family to love the area. So he bought it. Uh, they did a, a cursory environmental study. Wasn't very deep. After the sale closed, uh, he was out with one of the land um, gentlemen that, uh, that, that took care of the property, and he said, well, let's go see what I bought. Um, so they did, and many of you know what push bowling is. Uh, they were in a pier rug, and they started push bowling down the Trinasa, the little bayou, and, and just like Jed Clampett, this sort of oil started coming up, and the more oil started coming up. And he asked the guy at the time, his name was Leroy Trahan, he said, Leroy, what the heck is all that? He said, oh, Mr. if you think, you think that, he said, that's oil, man, that's oil. He said, well, wait a minute. I mean, we did an environmental audit. What happened? He said, yeah, but they didn't do it very thorough, Mr. Dory. I said, uh-oh. He said, oh, you think that's bad? Oh, let's go all the way out to the tank batteries. So they went out to the tank batteries. And they, were still, they was left there like it was in the 1950s. Gloves, buckets, hard hats, everything was there. Said, oh, let me show you another site. So they went around. They found several sites that were there. Obviously contaminated sites, there's no doubt. So he... Hired a bunch of lawyers. They did, they did all their research, and they found that you know they went to some of very very small independents. As many of you know, the big guys sell a little guy to a smaller guy to a little, even smaller guy to somebody who has a, a garage out there trying to do something. Well, of course, they had no money for it. many of them out of business, bankrupt. So because of this legacy, they kept moving up the food chain. Get to Exxon, one of our biggest clients, Sam and Dan, one of the company's biggest clients, and Chevron. Um, now, these are two unrelated things. This is Bill's personal property, but the company could suffer because of his last name. So he just said, listen, boys, we're gonna, I need this cleaned up. So he, he contacted the executives of, of whom he knew and said, we need to talk. They went to a meeting and they talked about that. He said, listen, I, I need some help with cleaning this up, guys. And uh, they said, well, you know, Bill, I mean, you know, it's been a long time ago. And uh, he said, well, I know it's a long time ago, but I, I did my research. You owned all these properties. And he said, well, let me let my lawyers look at it. Okay, you let your lawyers look at it. He got no uh, no response. A few, few months later, he calls them up and said, we need to have another meeting. So they show up. Bill shows up to the meeting, but none of his friends show up. It was all lawyers. And they said, Mr. Story, I'm sorry, we're not, uh, we don't see any responsibility for cleanup. Um, you're just going to have to sue us. So he said, well, I'm going to contact EPA, which was doing all this simultaneously. EPA said, this is my job. That's 
Department of Natural Resources. That from the Department of Natural Resources said, that's not our job, that's EPA's job. So now he's got these two guys who have no, don't want to take responsibilities. The oil companies don't want to take responsibility. He had no alternative but to sue. Now here I am standing before you saying I don't like the lawsuits, but he did. So I want to get caught in the middle on this one. I don't like the lawsuits. I think there's other ways we could do this. And it goes back to collaborating, talking to the oil companies, bringing them all together, explaining it, and look, if you can't do it then, then I'm going to sue your pants off of you. I think we just took the attitude, we're going to sue you. So Bill sues. He won. He won and it was criticized because he sued Big Oil. Our biggest customers. Worldwide. We're a worldwide company. We're a billion dollar company. And we're suing our biggest customers. Here's where the issue became. The oil companies kept saying, look, we've been paying people. You don't see it publicized. We're settling. But you know what's going on? What, what happens to the money? It dissipates. It just disappears. It goes to the casino or wherever it goes. The, home, the, the landowner is not cleaning up the property. So they dug their heels in. Bill got with Don Briggs, Bob Loga, Randy Haney, others, and actually drafted legislation whereby the landowner now puts it into a trust. That was my brother who had actually done that, which is his went to a trust, and it's only to be used for cleanup. So it worked. Unfortunately, he did sue the oil companies, but I think that somewhere between there is a way to get that settled without this. Now we have New Orleans suing uh, on the coastal sides. We've got uh, Terrebonne Paris is now suing, and uh, you know what? It's devastating these communities, and it's, it's killing investment in, in Louisiana. So I don't think a blanket lawsuit is the answer. I think that there's somewhere in between that we could work on that. I think responsible parties, the ones that are accountable for the pollution, should be the ones to pay rather than otherwise, like the problems associated with Arlene's Parish. Okay, should the taxpayers pay for that? Well, I think that's a because different, that that's, a, that's, that's a bit of a different issue. With that right. I, I see that's two different well, issues. Coastal restoration and this are two different issues. I think well, the scientists would argue that, you know, that, that coastal restoration isn't solely done because they cut canals. That's maybe a portion of it, but oh. it's not solely the problem, Without right? I mean, how many hurricanes Without have we had doubt. since then? No, so I think that I think that's that, that's uh, and, and look, we've got to be good corporate citizens. My company was a good corporate citizen. Now, go on, then that'll move me to your bill. We were a marine construction company. We did a lot of self audits um, for the U.S. Coast Guard because we were required to. We did a lot of self reporting to the U.S. Coast Guard because of the the ramifications if we were to have an event and we didn't self audit and we didn't report. We were in deep, deep trouble. I mean, they would shut us down. Yeah. Now, if this particular bill, um, and I don't know it inside and out, it may be a good first step, but it sounds like it needs to be tightened up a whole lot more than what it is. Yeah. You know, why, you know, so I'm hoping that before this bill actually gets through, it'll certainly be, uh, uh, there'll be a real, real deep dive into it that says, we've got to tighten this thing up. There's no doubt. And we do have to be good corporate citizens. So I hope that kind of, yeah. and, and that's, where that's where my strength is, uh, and my and that's uh, that's my strength. I mean, Gail will tell you, uh, I've done that in my company. I've done that in negotiations. Y you've got to be able to tighten some of that stuff up, and you got to work hard at it. Well, it it is problematic, and I appreciate what your brother did to establish new law to um, make sure that the settlement money goes towards cleaning up the property because water resources are held in public trust for the people and we we can't have these multi-million dollar settlements and the property just sit there for decades agreed i totally so, agree with that um, you know, no, i'm on your side of the issue yeah i just think, but I, I, think I think all of this gets gets forgotten though when, when people go out and they make a blanket statement about we got to get rid of those legacy lawsuits. It's driving industry away. Well, really, what's driving industry away is we are going to be mobile, Exxon, Shell, yeah. BP. All of them have committed to going to renewable. But, but, but we still need to keep LNG. I agree. The transition's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. Well, the green, the, the green New Deal is not going to happen the way they say it. All right, it's not going to happen. We, you know, we're uh, relying, we're, we're relying on it for every sort of energy we can think of. Yeah. Uh, we, can, we can talk about this actually some more if you'd like, you know. Yeah. yeah. Mark, yeah. Just a question. Um, you and you, um, 
went back to college to get your degree, you said you you were more interested in communicating with the millennials. You learned Use the mic. The, you learned from the millennials. What was it that you learned to yeah. to improve the communication with millennials? Awesome. Yeah. Any suggestions? Yeah, the question was, uh, when I went back to school, I focused on communication, and the biggest, the biggest takeaway for me was working and dealing with millennials. And I think that was, a, for me, it was a big mis, um, misnomer that, uh, that the young workforce and the millennials were lazy, um, inattentive, jump from job to job to job to job, five, five jobs, they were saying, on average, five jobs uh, in a year or so. And, um, and I found that. And, and, isn't truly the problem. What they wanted was they really wanted more of. Uh, they want to be included. They want to be you know listened to, um, and they, they needed they want to be challenged. Well, those are the three biggest things that I found with millennials. And um, so when I took that back to the workforce, it it, were, it really changed my my my, um, my profitability projection. It just did because you know, they were more committed because I was giving them more information. You know, management typically says, well, I want to talk to my senior executives. I began doing uh, presentations uh, that was, was wide open. I would, I would actually talk to them about the projects we were completed, the projects coming forward, what our, what our revenue was for that month, whether we, well, whether we were successful in meeting projections or not. It was pretty open, wide open. And as a public health company, I got chastised for it. But I made sure that they couldn't take the numbers and figure out what my forecast was. They, it's just impossible. And when, they, when our CFO became comfortable with, I was just representing a small portion, um, then they were comfortable with it. But that's what they want. I don't find that's anything any different than when I was coming up. Uh, you know, my dad, my dad hated the music I listened to. My dad hated the fact that, you know, he, he always said I was lazy. Um, you know, you need to work like me. I, mean, I look at millennials and I see me. And, and, and what my advice was to the leadership of my company was, it was this. It was pretty simple. If we think we're going to change the mindset of these young people, we're wrong. We need to adjust to where we're thinking and get in alignment with what they're thinking. And if we don't, we will not, we will not succeed. And we, I had a, we had, I had, I had the highest retention rate in, in any division in, in the company worldwide as a result of going back and better understanding the people that I was working, working with and those that I, that I truly <coughs> relied on to become the future of the company. If I couldn't fix that problem, and we're all retiring, then what do we do? Uh, it was a perplexing problem, although it was so simple. We made it. We made it challenging, but it's all about that. I mean, it wasn't hard, you know. Just listen to them, keep them engaged, challenge them, and, and give them information. I mean, let's face it; that's all they do is look on the internet today for, for information. They gotta feel like they're part of the team. They need to, be, they need to feel like they're. That they're that they're valued and that they're going to be part of the future and they, and they'll go with you anywhere, anywhere. Thank you. Any other questions out there? We well, appreciate you. Uh, you being, is there a closing statement you'd like to make? Uh, no, I think everybody's getting tired. Other than the fact that first, thank, thanks for for being here. Thanks for listening to. To me, and my, some, sometimes I ramble and run off, but it's because it's important to me. Um, you know, I, I brought a map in case if someone wants to understand what District 31 even looks like. Um, so in case you want to even take a look at that. But uh, but again, thank you for having me, and Gail and I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank, thank you for coming. We really appreciate you. You don't have any questions for me tonight. I could keep you here all night. Well, I can go sit over there with you all night. Have a little, little, little glass of wine. I'm here, but I can definitely do that. But I'm here to learn and grow. I really am. Our <laughs> uh, next speaker, which will be two weeks, I think, uh, it'll be the 6th of, the, of, uh, of next month. And that's a gentleman by the name of Heval, Terry Heval. He was our director of utilities for about 22, 23 years. Uh, I think his information will be, I think, very interesting. Certainly, be enlightening. It's a, we all need to know a little bit about where LUS, uh, where it is, how we got there, and we don't want to lose it. That's my personal feeling about it. Uh, you, if you think we need to sell LUS, come talk with me. I can show you some reasons why you're not going to, you shouldn't sell LUS. It's not only about what we're going to pay, but I'm looking at children. You talk about grandchildren. 
and great-grandchildren, they're going to have to deal with that possibility of utilities being extremely expensive if we went to that in that direction. So I just wanted that my little two cents. Somebody wants to counter my statement, you'll come up and do it. But I, I thank you all very much for being here this evening and looking forward to the next meeting. God bless you. Am I too late for a question? Too, too late, sir. We, we shut things down. Okay. No, you can ask. Sure. Now, Jim? I'm really, I, thought, I thought you were just kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can ask. A, you can ask a question. Well, I mean, of all people to tell tell that too. <laughs> oh, I know. I was just. He he, uh, he he might take it personal, but I thought he was joking with me. He shouldn't have. You you are welcome, sir. Thank you. I'll be there in a minute. You're happy over that, I know. Cannot. In the French language is a good cannot. I've reached a point where, unfortunately, a lot of people don't ask questions. And I feel that there are some questions that need to be asked. One of the most important things in my mind right now is something you never touched on. I'm not putting you down. But I'm not in the oil and gas industry. But I am in the human industry. And I don't like the idea of somebody knocking on my door one of these days and it seems like it's going to happen and saying, you've got to take in 25 illegal immigrants or you're going to jail. What is your situation on this illegal immigration situation? And there's something else that really bugs me. I've noticed that recently the World's Championship Cycle Women's Champion is a transgender. The newest member of the, I can't read my own writing, the Gladless Life Wrestling Championship of a couple of states for girls was won by a transgender. Uh, the International Women's Weightlifting Championship for Women was won by a transgender. The Women's State Bicycle Racing Championship was won by a transgender. Uh, where is it going to stop? I mean, I'm not necessarily against the transgenders. They can do whatever they like. But come on, where, what happened to fairness? And just a couple of quickies here. What is your definition? Because I'm really confused. What is your definition on racial equality? I don't understand that. We have approximately 13% of the nation that are black, but yet it seems like if you have 100 jobs, they feel like many of them that they should be entitled to 50 of them. That's hardly equality. Another question, what the heck is fair share of taxes? I either owe a tax or I don't. So what is a fair share? And I could give you several more things, but I don't want to keep you here all night, such as one world government, uh, reparations. Uh, I, I'm for reparations. If you can show me one slave owner today or one person that uh, has, has been harmed by slavery and so many other things, but I'm kind of old fashioned. But uh, those are some of the things that bug me. Thank you. I knew you shouldn't let Ray ask a question. <laughs> oh, I still got some. But. Actually, we're I think we're aligned. To, so you, my answer is going to be fairly short because I think we agree on a, on a few of these things. On immigration, first and foremost, my grandfather was an immigrant. Um, of course, I think all of us here, we, we wouldn't be here if we uh, were all descendants of someone who, uh, who came here from other countries. I mean, you know, we talking about illegal. I know, but unless we're a natural, uh, a natural, um, you know, excuse me, a Native American of some sort. And our reason, the reason I mentioned that is I think that our parents, our excuse me, parents and grandparents, great grandparents came here legally. They followed whatever processes that were necessary. My, my, uh, I think mine, I think Gales came through New York. Mine, I think, I'm not sure, I'm not sure where, I couldn't find out where they actually migrated to. I think they came through Canada, though, being, uh, being ousted from Canada as a, as a, as a Frenchman. I don't think that the country can tolerate the influx of illegal immigrants that, that we're seeing today. And, and what bothers me about some of that is we have, we have such a divided um, definition of what that might look like. 
President Trump actually recently, uh, he recently said, you know, why don't we, if you really want illegal immigrants here, why don't you take them into your sanctuary cities? I don't think he truly meant that this was going to happen. I think it was just, his why challenge not? was, why not? but I don't think he truly meant it. I think his challenge was, it said, if you really believe in it, and it's like, we, like I mentioned to you, if you, if, if you see there's a problem and you, uh, you're going to be part of the problem, part of the solution, I don't think that he sees that the people who are complaining about it are offering a, a, a solution at all. So that's where his challenge came in. It said, you know, if you want to, if you want to have illegal immigrants and you're okay with that, then take them in your own homes. Doesn't solve the problem because we still have illegal immigrants here, and they're they're illegal, and we don't know where they came from. We don't know what their backgrounds are. We have no idea whether they're uh, whether they're criminals, whether they're carrying diseases. We don't. You know, we we just don't know. And once they get here, we may never like all likelihood never see them again. We just uh, heard Gail and I did. We just heard from uh, one of the border patrol uh, agents, and it was his uh, his thing was. Um, was uh, it was terrorism in the southern border? We you'd be surprised how many terrorists are coming through the southern border. He just listed them, <clears throat> one after the other. How many were caught? How many were arrested? Um, and then sent back and then released. And so we don't have a good program ourselves. They're even controlling what's coming through the borders. Once we catch them, we don't know what to do with them, and, or we release them, and we don't have authority for whatever reasons. So what's my position? My position is I. I is pretty strong. I mean, I believe in protecting our borders. We can't allow people to come here illegally, and it just you know, it just makes no uh, no sense at all. What like, would you do about it in Baton Rouge if you went over there? Pardon me. What would you do should you go to Baton Rouge as a representative regarding the? Illegal well, we need to. Well, the fact is, we, you know, we need to address that. That issue isn't even on any. It's from what I know, it's not on any list. It's not on any. It's it's nowhere near a discussion in Baton Rouge. Maybe that's that I know. why we were so, here. That, well, we need to have, but we should have that sort of a discussion. You know, we lived in Houston, Texas. Like Gail will tell you, Houston. Um, when we want to cut the grass, I had to use a, a translation app on my phone. I had to talk to it. Gail needed to have. This is a true story. Gail needed to have the uh, yard edged. So she uh, and the guy was kind of had it kind of crooked. So she says, "Oh, too much tequila." The guy understood that, but that's all he understood. And that's in Houston, Texas. So yeah, it's, it's an ongoing problem, and uh, it does need to be addressed. Trans transgenders. Look, God. Yeah, I'm a Catholic. God gave me the body that I have. Uh, you know, I choose to live in this body. Um, whether it's genetic with these people, I don't know. I'm not in their bodies. I'm not in their minds. Um, they have a right to do what they want. However, I think we have a true sport that's for women or a true sport that's for men. Having transgenders uh, actually compete against them, I don't think it's totally fair, especially if it's a male transgender who's competing against females and that. I just don't think it's fair. Uh, that's just my opinion. And we're all entitled to opinions, and, you know, as we know about opinions, uh, sometimes they all, we all got one, they all stink, but that's just my opinion. What was the other one? You had another one that you, uh, that you, threw, that you threw at me. Well, we didn't touch about the main thing I'd like to talk about, but I don't feel like walking up there again. No, just tell you, I can hear you. I am surprised of all people share the entertainer. Yeah. She made a statement that I have been talking to my friends about for some time. Uh, I don't like to jump on the Democrats, but they make it so darn easy. Do you really... She said yesterday on national television, she said, if you don't take care of your own, but she didn't quite finish it. If the Christians, and you profess to be a Catholic, if the Christians would get together and demand that we follow the Bible, it would be a lot easier. First Timothy chapter, First Timothy chapter eight, verse five says, if you don't take care of your own, you're worse in the eyes of God than a heathen, an infidel, a non-believer. Are we taking care of the homeless people, the homeless veterans in Lafayette, Louisiana, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana? Go to New Orleans. Look at all the homeless people down there. Is anybody Houston, can stand Houston, up in my face city. and tell me that we need to take care of the illegal immigrants and pay them approximately 35 6 Four thousand dollars a month before we take care of a disabled veteran. Yeah. You can't tell me that. We need to get the Christians together and demand that they follow the Bible. Isn't that simple? Well, if we just follow the Ten Commandments, wouldn't it be a better world? That's exactly right. You know, but to me, that's 
that, that solves a lot of a lot of problems. No matter yeah, who you, you are. Say something right. about it. You're a redneck. I understand. Hallelujah. I understand. <laughs> so again, thanks. Uh, thanks for for giving me out. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's much appreciated. I love your questions. I mean, I, I, these are thought provoking questions. You always ask these thought deep and thought provoking questions. And well, I love nobody it. else will. So That's we'll absolutely right. And I appreciate you for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I just yeah. wish I wasn't so bashful. <laughs> your, your shot. No other questions? The meeting stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, you're going to be here a minute? Yeah.